Welcome back, everyone. Continuing with our trip through the sensory systems, now we're going to talk a little bit about hearing, the vestibular system, taste, and smell. So in this first video, we're going to focus primarily on hearing, and then we'll get to those other systems a little later in the next um, upcoming videos. So first, I want to talk a little bit about the components of sound, because this will be important in how we perceive sound. So first, um, the amplitude of the sound, of the um, sound wave, so how high it is, you know, how high and low it is, um, each wave is, this is perceived as loudness. So the larger the amplitude, the louder the sound is going to sound to us. Uh, frequency is how quickly the sound wave cycles. So the number of cycles per second of a vibration. Um, so this is usually measured in hertz. So how it's truly how many times, how many cycles do you have every second? So if something is 60 hertz, then you're going to have 60 cycles of it every single second. So now with frequency, this is actually perceived as pitch. So the higher the frequency something is, the higher the pitch it's perceived as. So this is how um, this is how we perceive these things. So um, loudness again is amplitude. So how tall the wave is, whereas the pitch is determined by the f the frequency. So how quickly it's cycling. One thing you'll notice is that everyone's um, pinna, which is the outside of the ear, is shaped differently, and it's actually shaped in a very particular way um, in order to amplify a certain range of wavelengths. And this is usually the wavelengths that that animal is optimized to hear. So that's why you see each animal having a different pinna. It's because it's actually optimized to hear the types of um, sound waves that your ear is optimized to hear. So again, the external ear pinna, um, its job is really to collect and amplify the sound waves from the environment. And this will help us transform these sound waves into energy, into, um, or rather transform this energy into neural impulses so we can actually perceive and process in the brain. So you have the pinna here, so the sound comes in, it's amplified by, by the pinna, and you get down to the um, middle ear. So the goal, the main reason we have the middle ear is to concentrate these sound energies as much as possible. So there are a couple things that are involved here. First, you have these three ossicles, which are little bones. They're the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And they, you don't need to know the names of them. They're small bones, and they connect to the um, tympanic membrane, also known as the eardrum. Of the, um, they connect the eardrum to the oval window. So looking at here, you can see here's your oval window. Here are your ossicles. So they're connecting to the oval window. And what they do is these bones help concentrate the tiny mechanical forces of vibrating air par particles. And what they do is they force the pressure from the um, relatively large tympanic membrane. So again, here's your eardrum. So the eardrum is pretty big. It's affecting these ossicles, and it's focusing this movement on this rather small oval window. So the result of this is it actually amplifies that sound pressure so it can produce movement in the fluid of the inner ear, which is where transduction occurs. Remember again, transduction is the process of changing sensory information into neural impulses. So it's where the magic happens. So that happens in the inner ear. Now it's worth mentioning there are actually two muscles um, in the middle ear that um, vary the linkages of the ossicles. And you'll want to write down uh, the names of these because at least one of these is in the test bank, just so you know. So what these muscles do is when activated, they can actually stiffen and make it so these ossicles can 
can't vibrate as much. And in doing so, they reduce the sound's effect. So if there's like a really loud noise to help pr um, protect your ear, they actually will stiffen in order to minimize the, the noise that's affecting your ear. So then we get to the inner ear. So in the inner ear, um, there are simple structures that will convert the sound into neural activity. So on this slide, we're just going to define some of these. And then on the coming slides, we'll talk about how they actually work. So first, you have the organ of Corsi. So this is part of the cochlea, um, and it's the primary site of sound transduction. So remember, in in mammals, we have a fluid-filled cochlea. It's a spiral structure, and um, so with this, the organ of corti is part of this larger cochlea. You also have sensory cells or hair cells that look um, like this. So with this, these are the um, actual, um, I guess, structures that are responsible for the transduction, as we'll see in the coming slides. There are several supporting cells we'll talk about. And then there's the basilar membrane, which is right along here. So the basilar membrane is actually what vibrates in response to sound, and that's what um, the hair cells are detecting, is the vibrations of the basilar membrane. So again, um, the sound causes the basilar membrane to oscillate or to vibrate. And what we found is that actually different parts of the basilar membrane uh, vibrate at different frequencies. So high-pitched frequencies um, or high frequencies displace the basilar membrane at the narrow end of it, the narrow base of it, whereas low frequencies displace further down at the wider part of it. So with this, one way that we perceive pitch um, is based upon where along the basilar membrane we are actually detecting the vibration. So now let's get into the actual sensory cell. So how does this work? So what happens is each human has two sets of cells. Um, there's a single row of about 3,500 inner hair cells, and then there are about 12,000 outer hair cells that are in three rows. And between, with each hair cell, there are between 50 to 200 cilia, which are these little things on top that protrude, or it stands for stereocilia. They're little hairs that produce or protrude from each hair cell. And as we'll see, they actually help make the hair cell a little bit more um, sensitive. So there's actually an auditory nerve fiber, as you can see here, um, that contact the base of the hair cells. And here, there are two different types of nerve cells. They're actually both afferent, so those are um, nerve cells that go to the brain, and then they're efferent, that go from the brain. And both of these paths are very important for this process. So the inner hair cells, so again, there are about 3,500 inner hair cells. The inner hair cells are actually responsible for detecting sound, and thus 90 to 95% of the afferent nerve connections are going to those inner nerves, or those inner hair cells. The outer hair cells don't actually sense sound. Instead, what they do is they push on the uh, tectoral membrane in response to communications from the brain uh, via the efferent channels. So this helps fine tune and amplify the organ of corti. So you have the 3,500 inner hair cells. Those are the ones that actually are detecting the sound. And then you have the uh, 12,000 outer hair cells. They're the ones that are kind of amplifying or modifying in order to tune the ear properly to whatever sound you're listening for. So what happens is as sound causes vibrations um, in the bas basilar membrane, the vibrations bend the um, hair cell cilia and 
move the hair cell a little bit. And what this does is it causes an opening of the calcium and potassium ion channels, causing the cell to depolarize. And then once the threshold is obtained, um, it will cause neurotransmitters to be released. So that's how these are actually, that's how they actually transduce it. It's that you're looking for these um, hair cells to actually move and it causes, that's what triggers the, um, those ion channels to open and this process to actually take place. So there are actually also these little you see these little lines in between each of these um, stereocilia? These thin fibers are called tiplings, and they run across each of the hair cells' um, stereocilia and connect them all like a network. And the reason why is so that if one cilia is activated, then the tiplings can help activate all the others, which will help depolarize the cell faster. So you can see here with the cell where um, with the tip links um, up here connecting them, it makes it so all of these move together, which causes those ion channels to open. We see our ion channels down here, and that causes the neurotransmitter to be released and the um, signal to be sent to the brain, because as you see, this is an afferent nerve. So again, as we've talked about before, afferent is going toward the brain. So we have Again, you just have, um, with the bending of the stereocilia, you have ion channels opening up, causing the cell to depolarize, which leads to neurotransmitters being released. So that's how transduction occurs. So now tr the transduction occurred, we have this, the neural impulse, where does it go? Well, the cochlear nuclei, so the nuclei and the cochleus, um, have several targets. One is the superior olivary nuclei, which is right here. So the superior olivary nuclei receives bilateral input, so it receives input from both sides, um, both ears. You also have the inferior colliculus, um, or together, these are the colliculi. Uh, which are in the midbrain, as you see here, and they also get the information. And what, but what you see is, unlike um, here where you're getting it from both sides, here you have it just from one side. And what you have here is it then sends that to the medial geniculate nuclei, which is right here and here. The medial geniculate nuclei are actually part of the auditory thalamus. So again, it's another um, sensory system that goes through the thalamus. And it acts as the relay station, the thalamus relay station, between the inferior colliculus here and the auditory cortex here. So then that information goes to the auditory cortex where it's processed. So, as far as pitch, I hinted at this a little earlier, there are two theories of pitch discrimination that are important. One is the place theory and the other is the volley theory. Now, what's interesting is there's actually evidence for both of these, and they're both actually accepted because they're non-antagonistic. So they both help explain how we have uh, how we hear pitch. So it's not that one is correct and the other isn't. Um, it's that they can work together and both be correct. So one, as I was talking about earlier, is the place theory, which is that pitch is determined by where the receptors are activated along the basilar membrane. Um, so it's about where the vibration is, that that is what determines what pitch you hear. So this is supported by the fact that, of course, as we mentioned, different frequencies do cause different areas of the basilar membrane to vibrate. There's also the volley theory, which postulates that pitch is determined by the rate of firing. So this is supported by the fact that auditory neurons fire at different rates for different pitches. So because of this, it's actually believed that pitch is encoded both ways, both based on where the vibration is and also by the rate of firing of the neuron. 
So um, there are also binaural cues, which are the ways we're able to detect where sound is. So you may notice, you know, even if you close your eyes, if someone's bouncing a basketball, you're able to, to some extent, figure out roughly where that sound is coming from. And the reason why is because uh, the sound gets to your ears at different times and in different strengths, and that helps you know where the sound is coming from. So first, there's an intensity difference. So this is the difference between in loudness between the two ears. So the thought here is that the the ear that has the greatest loudness is likely closer to the sound source than the ear that has less loudness. Secondly, there's a latency difference, of course, which is the difference between the two ears and the amount of time it takes for the sound to arrive. So with that, that also will tell you, in this case, if the left ear gets the sound before the right ear, then the sound is going to be closer to the left than the right. And the extent of this tells you roughly where the sound is coming from in space. And lastly, deafness. Um, there are three main causes of deafness that are worth talking about. Um, conduction deafness occurs when the outer or the middle ear prevents vibrations that are needed by the cochlei, uh, or by the cochleus rather, from occurring. So for instance, the ossicles can get fused and not transfer the vibrations efficiently. This can sometimes be rectified by surgery. Um, there's also sensory neural deafness, and this occurs when there are problems within the cochlea or the auditory nerve. This may happen due to illness, uh, toxic effects of medications, exposure to loud noises, uh, things like that. So typically what happens is with loud noises, you can have the cilia become shattered and broken, preventing them from sensing those vibrations and their cochlear implants have actually been shown to be able to help restore hearing in people with sensory neur um, neural deafness. And lastly, there's central deafness. This is brain damage that results in deafness. Um, it's often due to um, a brain lesion or a stroke. Uh, word and cortical are two examples of central deafness. In word deafness, a person can recognize simple sounds, but is unable to recognize spoken words. In cortical deafness, patients have difficulty recognizing both verbal and nonverbal auditory stimuli. Uh, cortical deafness is rare because it requires bilateral damage to the auditory cortex. So you have to have damage on both sides of the auditory cortex. Another thing that I think is interesting is that individuals who are centrally deaf may still respond reflexively to sounds in the environment, such as a sudden loud noise, and it's because this is mediated by the brainstem. So even though you may have those cortical areas um, not working, you still have the responses to the sounds because, as we mentioned, the sound information doesn't just go to those areas, it goes to places in the brainstem as well, and that's where you have that reaction from.